Friday to you. It is the 28th of September. Can you just imagine? Like we're at the 28th day of September, like the ninth month of the year. Don't you remember us just having the conversation and the onset of the new year and all of our hopes and dreams and aspirations of what we were going to accomplish? Do you remember that? Well, we're about to revisit that when we get closer to the countdown to see if we have met the mark. But outside of that, you're officially tuning in to Coffee and Conversation with Colette, and I'm Colette, and I do my curtsy, and I'm just so happy to be here with you if you all can't tell. You all just don't even really understand who you are to me. I mean, the joy that I get in anticipation of what we're going to discuss, what you're going to share with me, who you're going to consistently show me who you are, and your thoughts, and then your analytical process is just so encouraging. So very excited. All the lines are lit right now because you know that we're going to continue the conversation from yesterday. And then we're going to add into that the little nuance of Kavanaugh. They started the hearings yesterday. I'm sure that you all saw that. It was on, you know, of course, major stations throughout the day. Of course, I was able to pick up the hearing as well. So I have some insight into that. We're going to mesh that into the conversation. But it doesn't negate where we stood yesterday. You all recall, on yesterday we were talking about the breaking of the $400 million buck the life and time of Bill Cosby. And yes, I said the breaking of the buck. You all recall from a historical perspective what would happen back in slavery when you dealt with a strong black man, and all of our men are strong, we have to speak life into our men, but the strength of a black man who wasn't going to be submissive to the overseer or to the slave master, if you will. And so they, uh, you know, folks don't have to be accountable for the things that they've done. Just let me just tell you, it, it's going to come, what do they say, when the chickens come home to roost, it ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun. For the simple fact that you would have an ideology to come up with things to do, to be raped, to be little, to um, put into force into submission, just from, even if not the person that you were raping, the breaking of the book included raping of black men in front of their families. I mean, the mindset of that. Right? So maybe throughout the years they figured that, okay, we can't do it the way we did it then, but we're going to do it now. And we're going to do it in such a way that it's going to be from your name. We're going to defame you. We're going to discredit you. We're going to change everything about who we created you to be in this society so that there's a stigma attached to you. And that, I believe, and I'm just saying this, exactly is what happened to Bill Cosby. Because remember, Bill Cosby was the American father for black folk. You didn't ever see until the Cosby show came on a fully functional household that would mirror that, that would rival that, that would exceed that of the white households that you saw on television. You saw two successful parents, children, dealing with everything that children and young people do through adolescence and siblings and all the like and those engagements, but that's what you saw. You saw the issues, you saw the challenges, and you saw the solutions. And then there was some comic component to there that, of course, was so synonymous with Bill Cosby, and so that became the staple in our lives. That was our mainstay for years. Generations, my generation, we grew up on the Cosbys. And then they did the spinoff of what, A Different World to show uh, young people going off to college and what that experience looked like for black children at HBCUs. And it just changed the perspective. It changed our narrative. 
And a lot of times, because we remember, we get to the truths, their issues and their symptoms. Everything that majority of media addresses are the symptoms. They don't want to get to the underbelly. They don't want to get to the issues because they know that there will be some different conversations if you have to get to the issues. If we get to the issues, if we remove ourselves from that first la layer of life, then we just move that on over and I'm going to deal with the truth. I'm going to deal with the truth of you still believing that I'm the Geppetto, I'm the Pinocchio to your Geppetto. That's what they want us to believe. That we're the Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Lion to their eyes. That we can't do anything. We won't be successful. Our drive and our goals will only be accomplished if they say so. If it's what they say. Noam Chomsky wrote a book. Remember, it's what they say. And so I believe that that is the issue of what we're dealing with, again, with Bill Cosby, that you wait until a man gets to be 81 years of age. Of course, historically, he has been trying and trying to buy a network. You all, I believe, the, who they say is the majority, but you all know that there's only a, a small percentage of those who control what happens in America. From the visual perspective, of course, to the infusion of money and the financial perspective, to the consumer habits, that's just how America was built. That's how America was made. And so they decided that, you know what, no, because if I can break him, I'll let the rest of them, those others of them that believe that they have millions and they're on the Forbes list and they can amass some kind of change through the influence of their power. Because the majority of us don't understand what power does. We think that money is a direct relation to power. No, no. I'm going to dispel that myth for you right now. And there's some of you that might agree, disagree with me. At the end of the day, you can have money and not know what to do with it, and it doesn't enforce power. The true art of it is to have power, to have conversation, to have influence that captures the money to then move into action. And so when you have the ability, like Bill Cosby, to be able to have the money and then have the power, that means that you can move into action. You understand what your relationships do. And then you have the money to back it, but then you have others that believe in you and have those means as well. And then it becomes a socioeconomic component. Everybody get it because we get so caught up in class. And it's not about class. That's the bait and switch of America. I want you to believe that it's about your class. Well, if you keep believing it's about your class, then I'm going to keep you empowered. I'm going to keep you um, uh, enslaved to me. Not empowered, disempowered. Because if you believe it's just about, so if I'm poor and you're poor, then we're supposed to be fighting each other while the rich keep getting richer. But if you realize, that, wait a minute, I'm poor and you're poor, and I'm black and you're white or you're yellow and you're whatever the case, whatever your skin cue happens to be, but we're all poor. We're all experiencing the same scenario. We're all dealing with the same life issues. That if we can get to that understanding, then that's where the power comes from. Because then we will yield power because collectively we will create a voice that then demands other things. But the majority of us believe that it's about color and not class. And those who are in a class know to a certain degree, it's those of us of color who move ourselves, we raise up into a class, and then we believe that we're just like them. No, no, let me stop you there. You can amass money and move, change your socioeconomic status, but that still doesn't mean that you identify with them. Remember, we showed you a clip some months ago, a CNN clip about that 1%, and it was Mrs. Johnson who used to be married to BET's Johnson, and then it showed how she, they had a divorce, but she had wealth, and she created a equestrian farm, and that she still wasn't accepted. And she came from a privileged background. Dad was a surgeon and the like, but she still wasn't accepted. And so I think that's where we are today. We're in a space and time that we have to look at, and I believe that Bill Cosby is a prime example of what it looks like when you are working in your wealth, in your power, in your influence, and they figure, I got to stop you. Because remember, Harry Weinstein, this happened way before Bill Cosby. He wasn't the first celebrity, but he's the first celebrity to be penalized. He's the first celebrity to go to jail to be stripped of his honorary degree from Temple. They're discussing trying to remove his uh, star. They're discussing, of course, that they've stripped and ceased the reruns of the Cosby show, so that's how he gets his revenue. 
You understand what's happening in America? And so that's what I wanted us to question. That if we understand that to be its truth, and the quote that I gave us, and it's still the quote that I'm going to go with today, it's still relevant to the conversation today, and that quote is from Judge Stephen O'Neill. That is the judge that presided over the trial for Bill Cosby. And what did Stephen say? Judge O'Neill state, quote, no one is above the law, and no one should be treated differently or disproportionately. But it seems like it only applied to this black man in America. Because we can give example upon example of those who have, who actively work in the belief that they're above the law, and so much so that a lot of them are the law itself. They carry the badge. They carry the power with the badge that says that I have a gun, and then at my discretion, I determine when I'm going to pull it, how I'm going to use it, and then the story that I'm going to make attached to the act that I've done that then is going to justify why I did what I did. And so Judge Stephen O'Neill on this day, as God will continuously do, is no, sir, no. We, correct, no one is above the law, and no one should be treated differently or disproportionately, but that is who America is. They say justice is blind, that's what they say. Maybe she wears a cheesecloth so you can see through it because it's only applicable for certain people in certain situations, certain means. So this is what we're going to discuss today. Everyone I see, all the lines are lit. This is our two-hour of power, so I'm so excited. What we're going to do, indulge me for a minute, we're going to go to this clip. I want to see a clip with Don Lemon. He's going to draw the parallels between Kavanaugh and Cosby. It's about seven minutes, and then we're going to go and have the conversation. So let's take a minute to enjoy the clip, and we'll be right back. Okay, so listen close. Nice. Bill Cosby is in prison tonight. Bill Cosby is in prison tonight. Something I could not have imagined saying just a few years ago in all of my years growing up. Cosby was sentenced to three to 10 years in prison for drugging and assaulting Andrea Constat back in 2004. In a press conference after the hearing, prosecutors talked about how the ugly reality of Cosby's crimes finally caught up with his once squeaky clean public image. For decades, uh, the defendant has been able to hide his his true self and hide his crimes uh, using his fame and fortune. He's hidden behind a character created, Dr. Cliff Huxtable. Um, it was a seminal character on TV, uh, and so was the, the family, but it was fiction. I said this last night not so long ago. Bill Cosby was America's dad. His character and his TV family were an iconic representation of, Af of the African-American family. And Cosby commanded a lot of respect in the black community. So it was pretty shocking, but perhaps not too surprising when today his defenders, his last remaining diehard supporters, framed his downfall in terms of race. It's more than a little ironic that the man who made respectability politics a huge part of his message and preached about the morality in the black community took no responsibility for his own actions, his own behavior. Remember, self-responsibility, he's talked about it all the time. Well, his spokespeople blamed racism, sexism, portrayed him as a victim. Listen. Cosby's doing great, and Mr. Cosby knows that God is watching over him. He knows that these are lies. They persecuted you're, Jesus, you're and look what happened. Not, not saying Mr. Cosby is Jesus, but we know what this country has done to black men for centuries. So with at least 60 accusations against Cosby, his accusers began to come out with such regularity that their stories, their stories were so horrifying that it became a steady drip that could not be ignored in the Me Too era. There were a lot of legal twists and turns to get to this point today. The incredible sight of Bill Cosby in handcuffs being led to prison while wrapping up the trial, the judge, Stephen O'Neill, said no one is above the law and no one should be treated differently or disproportionately. By the way, that picture you're looking at, can you put that back up? That's his mugshot. That's his mugshot. Those are important words that the judge said to keep in mind. In this Me Too era, this trial plays out to its conclusion while another proceeding in Washington awaits. One person making that connection explicitly. 
and that's Bill Cosby's publicist. What is going on in Washington today with Judge Kavanaugh is part of that sex war that Judge O'Neill, along with his wife, are a part of. A sex war? Right now, a Supreme Court nominee faces two allegations of sexual assault or misconduct from his time in high school and his time in college back in the late 1980s. Kavanaugh denies that they ever happened. Now, I want you to hear me very clearly here, okay? The accusations are nowhere near the scale of what Cosby allegedly did to 60 women over the course of decades. And I'm not saying that, that they are, okay? The things Kavanaugh is accused of may or may not have happened. We don't know, and it's likely we will, we won't know unless there is an investigation, and that's the whole point of it, right? When Bill Cosby was initially accused, many people for many years could not believe it. The women's accounts were questioned. It took a very long time and a lot of investigating and multiple proceedings before there was a verdict as to the truth of what really happened. This is what you need when you want to determine a finding of fact. And legal experts like our Jeffrey Tubin, well, they point out that's what's missing in what's being planned in Washington for Thursday, a real investigation. It might get us closer to the truth, to the facts. It might clear Judge Kavanaugh, or it might validate his accusers' accounts. Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski made the same point to our Manu Raju today. Should there be a full FBI investigation into these allegations from Kavanaugh's past? Well... It would, sure, path, it would sure clear up all the questions, wouldn't it? But the White House will not ask the FBI to investigate. There is going to be a Senate hearing, but only Christine Blasey Ford, the accuser, and Kavanaugh are testifying. No subpoena for Mark, Mark Judge, the only witness named by Christine Blasey Ford. No testimony by the polygraph expert who tested Ford or by trauma experts, as Ford has asked. And the Senate Judiciary Committee is going to vote on Kavanaugh just a day after the hearing. Just a day. They already said it, put it on the schedule. Why the rush, though? A lot of Senate Republicans are suge suggesting that the allegations are part of a political conspiracy. Well, it's amazing to me that these allegations come out of nowhere at the last minute and that they weren't brought up earlier in, the, in this process. And it's not untypical for our friends on the other side to pull that kind of crap. The weaponization of unsubstantiated smears. That's what we have here. And by the way, they have the backing of the president, who is accused of sexual misconduct by 19 women himself. I think it's horrible what the Democrats have done. It's a con game they're playing. They're, con, they're really con artists. They're, they're trying to convince... You know, they don't, believe, they don't believe it themselves, okay? They know he's a high-quality person. They don't believe him. It's just resist and obstruct. Hmm. There is an old saying, the truth will come out. It just might not happen on the Senate's timeline. And maybe a better saying is, the truth will set you free. I appreciate that clip of Don Lemon. And let me just tell you, the truth will set you free. And don't you think it's just ironic? Like, when you watch all of this, do you feel like you're being punked? Remember that show, Punked? Like, can you believe, like, you just think at some point somebody's going to jump out and be like, aha, all of it's a joke. Like, President Trump is a joke. His conversations are a joke. How dare he let anything that comes out of his mouth, it's about resistance and obstruction. Are you serious right now? R Trump, really? You use the terms resistance and obstruction. Oh, okay. And then political conspiracy. Oh, okay. And hide his true self and his crimes. When did Bill Cosby hide his true self and his crimes? When you, there's another clip, and I can bring it up, when he had interviews with his family, and then he said, yeah. I bought them. I bought the Quaaludes. Then he said, were you intended to use them on the girls? He said, yes. I mean, like, he didn't hide anything. 
So it's so funny when they talk about art imitating life and then life imitates art. But at some point, when do you separate that that was a character, this was entertainment, and he was doing what most people do, which people still do today, which is no different than all those white men who were sitting there then being judgmental, then being able to create a conversation and a narrative that justifies what's going on with Bill Cosby and his sentencing and then the eradication of his wealth comparative to Kavanaugh, that you want to give a life seat on the court, a life seat. And let me tell you, in the interview and the hearing yesterday, Mrs. Ford knew what was going on. She didn't stumble. And, and I thought about that. I was like, wow, just to be able to think through what happened 30 years ago, remembering times, people's people, faces, Every, she And then she would correct herself if she made a statement that wasn't in, in its full truth as she wanted to present it to the um, committee. And I just said, well, now she was convincing to me, but I'm asking you all, is this even about truth? Because that's what we get caught in. It's the bait and switch to have all these different factors and making you focus on what it is, but it's really not that. It's not about the truth. It's about what your voice is in America. It's about the, what power wants to do to usurp your voice and your authority to accomplish its bigger task. And so at the end of the day, I'm asking us, where does that leave us? What do we think? What do we, hello, and then more importantly, not outside of what are we going to think? What are we going to do about it? It's an election cycle right here. We consistently talk about the tale of two cities. Where are we going to go with this? So now I appreciate all your patience. I'm going to get to the line so we can start this conversation. I believe that we have given a complete overview as much as we can. If I believe that we need some additional information, absolutely, you know, I'll throw in, I'll sprinkle in a couple other things. But let me now go to what you'd like to share this morning. So great, amazing morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. I didn't hear your show, but I just wanted to comment like this. Okay. Uh, the melanated folks are the goal the elites profit from and control. Mm -hmm. Those who control the information, communication, yeah. education, controls how the masses believe, live, love, and think. Yeah. And until you study the science and the true history, then you will understand why and how the criminal elites rule the poisonings, the dismantling, yes. and lying goes on continuously and presently. Yes. But if you only study and research for yourself yes. to improve how to support your own navigating, they are not only poisoning the earth, yes. they're poisoning the minds and the bodies. Yes. And if only you knew that you are the goal that yes. keeps them profiting, by controlling your mind and your souls. Yes. Thank you for oh, taking absolutely. my call. Thank you so much for calling. I and mean, she absolutely set the tone. And I really want you all to get what she shared with us on today. Though, and I'm going to maybe add a little addendum to that. I believe those who have and understand the information control the conversation. And let me just tell you, because that's applicable for any area that you're going into in your life. You could be, I, I share with you all, um, I had a scenario with a client and we were in a workshop setting and they included us in the role play. And the client was like, well, no, I'm just here as an observer. And he didn't want to be included in the role play. And I, they said, well, you don't have a choice. You're a part of it. You have to be included. And so they gave the scenario that uh, we were this telecommunications company and we had to, they were going to lay these fiber optics and we had to go before a city council and talk about the, um, the plans for the company, right? So you know me. Think, everybody, think and grow rich. As a man, think of. Doesn't mean you have to agree with all the information that you get, but you better get the information. So what did I say to myself? I said, okay, Colette, now, I'm not an engineer. I don't know all the components of the planning process as it pertains to the fiber optics and telecommunications and laying the lines and all that, but I know people, I know communications, and I know marketing. So my presentation was to, I switched it. 
I talked about the importance of sharing this message and what this uh, enhancement was going to do to the community and then to buy in the support of council. And so after I finished my little spiel, they gave me a standing ovation. I wasn't even supposed to be part of it. I was consulting my consultant and then they gave me a standing ovation. And the young lady said, you know what, you could sell ice to an Eskimo. And I said, well, at the end of the day, you just got to know who you are. If you know who you are, you know who they are, and you get the information, you can always make it work for you. Let me say that again. Know who you are, know who they are, have information, and make it work for you. See, our problem is we might have one or the other. Like Bill Cosby, he knew who he was, but he didn't, for the majority, the truth of who he was, it wasn't unfolded. He was still known as Bill Cosby, and I'm sure, uh, Dr. Huxville, and I'm sure that he used that to his advantage, and we're not mad about that because that was the brand that he created, and so you create relationships and wealth based off of your established brand. So he knew that. I don't believe he hid who he was in his social dynamics because I believe that was a culture, and there was a way of that time. I believe that people were conscious about, as I shared with you yesterday, where they were going the women what they were doing you knew what this was stop if that's the case I said you need to go and go after their agents and their handlers if they're the ones that told them well hey you're gonna meet him at six o'clock for dinner at the Shea LaRouche you need to go on over there and get ready because you're gonna have dinner with them why would you need to have dinner with him if it's something business that the agent is going to manage y'all think just think about the scenario Understand what you're walking into and understand what the goal is of the players who are in the room. So the agent had to set you up because the client expressed an interest in you. Doesn't have anything to do with if you're going to get a part for the movie, your acting ability, your capabilities and the like. It was a simple fact that if he had an interest in this woman, they brought him to him. That's what I want. Bring it to me. And so in order to get the deal, to get the contract, to stay in good favor, to be able to say you have the relationship, the agent said, okay, I'm just going to pass her along. And that's what it is. And that's what happens in so many areas in which we engage in. People decided that they wanted Detroit. So they created a narrative that, oh, the city is withered and tired and broken and beaten and it, there's no revitalization. It's the top crime city in the nation. Don't you think it's so interesting that if you have a full municipal government with a communications department that they haven't come out with any conversation that combats the narrative that we're this crime-written city? You haven't seen any campaigns that talked about Detroit is this and Detroit is that from a national perspective, Right? Have you thought about that? So if I want to create the ideology that there's nothing going on in Detroit, that the value of living in Detroit is nothing, that everybody's poor, that everybody's broken, then that's going to have an impact on the valuation of property. So then me with wealth, I'm going to come in, and wealth and access, or access and relationship which creates power to other people's money. And then I'm going to come and I'm going to buy up all the property because it's so bad here. Because they're just going to give us anything because they're happy that anyone's going to come. So much so now that they're talking about giving some $125 million to Ford. A Ford doesn't need $125 million for what? Those monies need to go back into giving grants to the citizens who have stayed here, who kept the trade afloat, who need a roof, who need a new furnace, who need paint in their house, who need, come on, do I need to keep going, weatherization, all the things need bills paid. That's what needs to happen. But see, I created the narrative because I had the information. And I created the narrative to say that we're this broken down spot so I can come in and do with it as I want and then have my way with her. So Detroit, they're having their way with her right now. And that 7.2, they're having their way. They're creating this. I'm telling you, this is great. We got restaurant week. We got all the games. It's shiny and bright and fancy until you get to the boulevard. And then everybody over on the boulevard, they're just thrown away. Well, if you're behind the boulevard, if you're not in them hot pocket areas, historic district, Bagley, you all know what I'm talking about, Rosedale. If you're not any of those, you're just thrown away. You might as well just put you in handcuffs and shackles like they did Bill Cosby because you forgot. I'm just going, yeah, you're not a value to us anymore. Now, you are a value because you kept our tax base going. You are with the ones here when everybody shut off the lights and left. So you were good enough for that to keep the skeleton together. But now when we decide that there's a value, it's something that we want, and so we want to now silence you. 
we want to put you away, then that's what we're going to do. That's what we've done. And we fall and pray to that. We fall and pray to those elected officials who were sitting right here focusing and saying that my voice is your voice and, and my vote is your vote and you're going to let me in. And the next thing you know, I told you all, when you cross that line from community servant to politician, it changes. And what have you seen right now? How does it look for us across that line? How does it look for us? Because we're still out in no man's land. I'm riding through Russell Woods yesterday. They're doing all of these uh, cement projects on the sidewalks. And I said, well, who's paying for this? <laughs> Where did this come from? The taxpayers are paying for this here. But if you go a couple blocks over, it looks like Beirut. Come on. We're talking about it. So as a people in this community, we've been broken. The perception that we've been broken, like breaking of the buck, majority of people of color in this great city of Detroit. So we've been broken. I'm going to break y'all, and then I'm going to rebuild it up the way I want it. So I'm going to rebuild it up and make you think that you don't have a value here. I'm going to rebuild it up to make the housing stock prices so high that you can't afford it. I'm going to build it up so then you can have to lose your house because I wasn't smart enough to reassess the values because I knew, A, if the people who were elected didn't know, you couldn't hold them accountable. And if I'm in power, I want you to not know so I can take your property. I keep trying to tell you all, everybody that's sitting on that council that had been here since the foreclosure crisis hit us in 2008, shame on you all for keeping them in office. And I mean every municipality across this state. Everybody who's sitting in an elected position who did not fight, that's from city council, that's from commission, that's from state rep, that's from state senate, that's from Congress, everybody sitting in them seats who didn't have a conversation about why are you not reassessing the value of these properties so that my residents can have a true payment towards what the real value is so that they don't lose their homes. Everybody who didn't say that, and they didn't say it, how are you all still voting for them? But see, they know that you don't know because you're so mired and I'm trying to kind of eat today. I got to try to keep roof over my head and lights on and food in my belly and that of my family and keep my children educated in a raggedy school system that you can't even focus on the bigger picture. And those of you that you gave that voice to and that vote to were sitting in office, they didn't know any better either. They just wanted a title. I'm telling it. So they're broken too for $2. They're broken because I could give you money and you're going to do my bidding. That's what it is. That's what this thing is right now. You all can act like you don't like it, and I know I'm going to get a conversation about it, but it's the truth. So if you can break the people, you break them by who they believe and see that they're not, you break them by putting in people, infiltrating people that look like them, that they'll believe in, who aren't equipped to help govern them, and then they just sit back and watch it unfold. Why well, everything is happening great around you. Everybody's telling you that this is this and this is that, and you're not benefiting from any of it. Y'all get where we're going? Let me go to the line. Maybe not. Maybe it's just me this morning. Thanks for your patience. Great morning to you. How you doing today? I'm amazing. Thank you. First, I got to give a shout out to uh, TV33. Yes. WHTS, uh, Comcast 91, Detroit Housing Park. Mm hmm. Uh, thank you, Miss Colette. Great look. Great show. Great thank topic. You. Um, we all know about. Kavanaugh, and about Bill Cosby. Okay. Now, mind you, when they come down to people who look like me, we have a tendency to empower entertainers. Okay. Meaning, Bill Cosby was nothing but an entertainer. Says who? Now, Says us? He got to a point. Can you hear what you're saying? Yeah, I was asking you on that point. Who says he's nothing but an entertainer? That's what you say black people say? No, no. I'm not saying that's what black people say. Oh. I'm not saying that's what white people say. Okay. I'm saying that's all I've known him to be. Okay. Because I've only seen him on a TV show. Okay. Now, outside of a TV show, mm -hmm. when I heard that man speak, my man came to Detroit yes. a few years ago. Yes. And he made a negative comment about the un 
educated black person. So when he made this comment about the uneducated black person, right, I personally had a whole negative opinion about him because it had nothing to do with his job, it had nothing to do with his bank account, it had nothing to do with his presence on TV. It had to do with the words that came out of his mouth. So all these years, I've never seen him in power. And when it comes down to a TV show, it might be a positive example of how people who look like me can be, but that TV show was produced on a white-owned network. That TV show was produced at a white-owned production company. Okay, so I don't, I just see it as entertainment. Now, based on the views and laws that things have happened in this country from 1950, 1960, 1970, and 2000, okay, there was a created opportunity for people to look like me and actually legal, act like, live like people that don't look like me or the term called white privilege. But mm -hmm. emulating anything, a concept or idea has nothing to do with the reality because here in the city of Detroit, you had an Indian village, you had a Sherwood Forest, and you had a university district. So there was already black professionals living in this community. So it wasn't like there's some places in the country that's never seen a black predominant area of middle, upper class. We residents of the city of Detroit, a generation of residents, we've seen it. We, we, we know about it. But there's places in this country that's never seen an upscale black person or don't even believe there's an upscale black person. So I'm not taking away what the image that my man put out here. Okay. I'm just saying what number to entertain. Okay. And I stopped empowering entertainers. Because at the end of the day, they, they, they're they entertaining. Somebody is paying them to be on TV. Now, I don't know about uh, CBS, NBC, 20th Century Fox, even uh, Warner Brothers. None of these networks are owned by people that look like me. Okay. So a lot of people that look like me get their information, their concepts, and their realities off of TV. But we don't run TV. So just because a person had the opportunity to make money for folks, I don't see that as a reason to glorify him. Because at the end of the day, when it came down to the money that he had and what he really did, what did he really do for people that look like me I just want to ask, what did you really do? Okay, so what I just wait, say really and stay there me. for stay there for a minute, and I'm gonna put this out here, and I know people are gonna. First of all, Bill Cosby was huge in the civil rights movement, but but let me just say this much: outside of that, why do we always have a expectation that people that look like us who've amassed some type of wealth and influence? are going to do something directly for us. Maybe the conversation, I don't know what his philanthropic areas have been. I don't know. Maybe the bigger conversation was if I buy a network, I can change the mindset through the images that they get and from the shows and the entertainment that they're so engaged in. I can't speak for them. I guess my bigger conversation I'm asking us to look at, to delve a little deeper, is that what does he represent as a $400 million person in America who absolutely paid for a woman. She, they, he was handled it out of court. She got millions of dollars out of court, but now yeah, yeah. he's coming That's back and he's doing jail time. I just, is. I'm just trying to get us to have the conversation. Yeah. I'm not assassinating Bill Cosby. No, I know that he had comments to your individual. point about him having comments and being back in Detroit. I remember that time. I think was it about how could you spend all this money on sneakers and not have education for the children, something like that. I'll look it up. But I'm no, like, but, but, and but I don't think there was anything wrong with that comment. Well, the, the the point I'm saying is this. It, it wasn't, we'll say, it wasn't white privilege that made Bill Cosby seem successful because he was an entertainer. They gave him a check. He played a role. Okay? It was when he had a TV show that talked about a black family able to do this and do that and had no negative images and you never heard anything that was surreal that was going on in the atypical household of people that look like me. He was glorified over it. 
But at the time when he was glorifying over it, he was still doing what everybody else do to get money. And they do what they do to entertain themselves. A lot of people, when they have excess money, like paying their bills, take care of things, they use their money to entertain themselves. So that's what he went to jail for, because he was entertaining himself with different women. Now, the, 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 now I'll put this out to Ryan DJ. How they played that 80 year old man, that was wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So I don't want nobody to, to, to distinguish the difference. I don't empower entertainers, but I know about the laws and the rules and regulations of living in this country. And I know that for an 80-year-old man to be classified as a violent... Sexual uh, uh, predator. A, 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 a sex offender. Over something he did over 14 years ago, when, when they caught the case, it was seven days before it was up. He, the female came around 14 times. He even gave him $3 million. How can you be classified as a sex violent offender around somebody that came around you 14 times, you gave him $3 million 10 years later. So we know, and I'm just going to put it out here, when, 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 when I said to you a couple years ago that the Klan was in the White House. I said that. Oh, yeah. Look, they're in the White what House. They're in, let me just, let me add to that. They're in the White House. They're down in City Hall, Detroit. They are up in Lansing at the Capitol. They're everywhere. They're driving down the street as a police officer. They are in the courts. I mean, they're okay. everywhere. But let me ask you this, and then we're going to go to break, and all the lines are lit. I'm going to get to everyone after we come back at the top of the hour. But do you all remember Leo Sharp? Leo Sharp was the, at that time, 89-year-old drug mule who was bringing in cocaine, was it like some, was it two kilos, 1.2 kilos of cocaine from uh, Michigan City, Indiana, into Detroit. Do you remember he was stopped outside of Ann Arbor? Do you remember him? Now, he was 89 mm -hmm. years old. They arrested him. He had, they had so allegedly documented some seven trips that he had taken, and he was supposed to get 30-some years in prison. He ended up serving early. He got out early, what, six months in because he was sick. He had dementia, and so he was at home with his family taking care of him. Now, this is a noted drug mule at 89 years old who only served for, what, four months in prison. And so I'm sorry, no. let, me, let me juxtapose that to where we are right now with Bill Cosby and a conversation in which it was addressed, but now he's going to jail. And what does that look like? I'm just asking, but this is what we're going to do. I'm up against a break, so you can hold on if you like. All the lines are lit. Call as I see you. I will be right back at the top of the hour because we're going to continue the conversation. But, you know, that's the only way to have a conversation. We're going to make sure that you're educated, enlightened, and empowered. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.